Hello, I'm Grandpa John. I've been retired for seven years. I'm actually a retired gastroenterologist. And in that seven years, I've been redoing bathrooms. I've now done seven. Each time I've learned something, and I want to share these things that I've learned with you. So I'm going to talk about some important details one needs to consider before doing a bathroom reno. First of all, let's talk about where you put the shower controls. Usually, we put the shower handle directly underneath the shower head. So when you turn on the shower, you get this blast of cold water on your arm. Why don't we put it somewhere else? So I had to put it underneath the shower in this basement bathroom because the right hand wall was an outside wall. We can't put the handles or the pipes in an outside wall. But what if it's an inside wall? Here's our ensuite bathroom. I put the shower control on the side so when I step into the shower, I can turn on the shower, have the water get out of the shower, and when it's warm, I can get into it. So think about putting the shower controls away from the head of the shower. Let's talk about hand sprayers. I always put in a hand sprayer. On the right, it is an integral part of the shower head, but I prefer what's on the left, independently plumbed. Why do you need to have a hand sprayer? Well, you can wash yourself, but more importantly, you can wash out the shower or bath enclosure. I like to install shower niches. These are really shelves built into the wall. You can put soap and shampoo in them, and you don't knock them over. Schluter makes an excellent system and you, you just put it in between two studs and you then tile over them. They come in one foot by one foot up to two foot by one foot systems. Next, let's talk about shower glass. Shower glass works really well. It lets in lots of light. It opens up the room. Here's our basement shower, and we've got glass on two sides, one with a door. Here's our ensuite bathroom, and we've got a one wall and a, and a quarter of a wall with glass. Note we haven't taken it right to the ceiling. If you can, and structurally it's safe, the best thing to do is not take it right up to the ceiling because this allows for ventilation and getting rid of the steam that's in the shower. Here's another example. This is a attic bathroom that I did at one of our kids. And I've solved the issue of a shower curtain and an entry by putting a shower glass wall as well as an integrated door. In one of my bathrooms, I put a curbless shower. What's a curbless shower? Well, you normally have a curb right here at the entrance to the sh shower. There's none here. And instead, what I've done is I've slanted the floor towards at the other end where I've put in what's called an invisible drain. It's not completely invisible, but it blends in with the tile work. You can make a curbless shower in two ways. You need a quarter inch drop per foot. So there's two ways to do this. One is you can cut and twin the joists to create sister joists. That's complicated and may threaten the structure of your house, so I wouldn't recommend it. The other way is using something called recessed ledgers, and that is basically dropping the subfloor up to about three quarters of an inch. The subfloor is usually three quarters of an inch, and you put the basically put the subfloor between the joists rather than on top of it. That gives you usually a three quarter inch drop, which allows you a three foot span. If you need more than that, you can add a half inch plywood to the rest of your floor, raising the bathroom floor by half inch. And that gives you another two foot span. So you can actually put up to five feet span, dropping the floor by an inch and a quarter. I would refer you to this YouTube video if you're interested in doing that. So, a curbless shower looks great. It's safe, you can get into it easily. 
uh, you can get a wheelchair in there if necessary. I think everybody should have a traditional bath in their house. The reason is, is it's really hard to shower one and two year olds. They like to sit in a bath and the parent can lean over the side. A lot of people say they never bath, so why do we need a bath? The reason is, is for resale of the house, if nothing else. Keep a traditional bath. Here is the bath in our ensuite. We do have another traditional bath. This one is very decorative, very comfortable, but it's very difficult for a parent to lean over the side and bath a child. Let's talk about sinks and mirrors. The first thing you should consider is whether your countertop will fit a double sink. Double sinks are really nice. They can give uh, a couple their own sinks. The kids can perhaps have their own sinks. Two people can wash up at the same time. Here is a double sink I put in my daughter's house. It's only four feet wide. I got this from Ikea. If you do have a countertop that's four feet wide or wider, you can certainly put in a double sink. If you're putting in a double sink, I'd also recommend putting in GFCIs at both sides of the sink. So perhaps two people could use hair dryers at the same time. Think about recessing the kick plate under the cabinet further than the usual three inches. It still supports the cabinet, but it's, if it's further underneath the cabinet, it looks like the cabinet's floating. The other reason is that if you've got big feet, you can get your feet underneath the cabinet, get closer to the sink, and not splash as much. Let's talk about mirrors. I like big mirrors. I like mirrors that go from this sink top all the way to the ceiling and from one wall to the other wall if there are walls on the side. At least the complete width of the countertop. Here's the mirror in our ensuite bathroom. Countertop to ceiling, wall to wall. Here's the mirror in our basement bathroom. Countertop to ceiling, drywall to glass wall. It really opens up the room having big mirrors. I like to put lights right on the mirror. Here's our ensuite. It has three lights. These lights are at a level of the at an eye level of about a six foot two person. They're mounted vertically. And what happens is the light comes in from the side when you're looking at the uh, at yourself in the mirror, and there are no shadows. To do this, you need to put the junction boxes in the wall prior to ordering the mirror. When the mirror people come, they drill a four inch hole for the junction boxes and you can put the, the lights right on. Here are the lights in our, what we call our children's bathroom. It has a five foot countertop, so we couldn't put the three lights in. Instead, we put horizontal lights just above head level two of them. These give a very diffuse light to your face so you don't get very many shadows. If you buy a pre-made vanity, it usually comes with a backsplash. I don't like to use it. I like to put the mirror right down to the countertop like we have here. Here's where the line is between the countertop and the mirror. It's very clean. All you have to do is to caulk it with some transparent caulking. In each of the bathrooms I've done, I've put in a hardwired makeup mirror. The reason for this is it's really hard, particularly as you get older, to get that thing out between your teeth or pluck some eyebrows, leaning over the sink in the other mirror. So I put in a hardwired makeup mirror. The level I put it at is so that the, the mirror itself is at the, le the eye level of a five foot four person. I always put in a GFCI protected outlet right beside the toilet. The reason for this is that V-Days are very popular. This is our V-Day on top of the toilet and all I needed was a GFCI plug in the wall. The water from it comes from the standard water supply for the toilet the BDA itself will heat the water if necessary. 
I put in light tubes in two of our bathrooms. This is the light tube in what I call our children's bathroom. It's basically a flexible reflective tube that goes from the ceiling of the bathroom out through the roof. It allows natural light to come in. In this long, narrow bathroom, it gives great light to that end of the bathroom. Seriously consider plywood backing on the walls in your bathroom. What this is, is it's half inch plywood that's put under 3 8 inch drywall. What it does, it provides a very strong surface to tack things on, such as toilet roll holders, towel bars, and even grab bars. What happens is, often you want to find a stud to attach things. The studs aren't always there, but if you've got plywood backing everywhere, you've got a strong substrate to tack things onto. Think about using pocket or barn doors in your bathroom, either as an entrance or if you've got, like we have, a cupboard off the ensuite bathroom. The problem with traditional swing doors is that they require about nine square feet of floor space for the door to swing out. This often gets in the way of clothing or a bathtub. So think about pocket or barn doors which do not swing out into the room at all. Don't use a traditional on-off switch for your fan. Get one of these. On the left, you have a timer switch. So if you have a shower, you can put it on five or 10 minutes. The fan will go off in five or 10 minutes. On the right, this is a double function switch. It detects the humidity in the room and it also ha has a timed switch. So if you have a shower, it'll detect the high humidity and go off when the humidity gets low enough. You can also push the button and the fan will go on for a set period of time, five, six, seven minutes. It's all preset inside. Finally, think about wheelchair accessibility. It's not something we like thinking about, but we never know what's going to happen. It's a lot easier to do it when the walls are taken down and you're making other major renovations. It's much harder to do at the time you really need the wheelchair. Think about wide doors. Think about a curbless shower. Think about the plywood backing that I spoke of before. All of these make it much easier for a disabled person to get around. Here are the examples. In our house, we have widen, a wide door in the entry to our ensuite. It used to be two feet wide. Which, which, which would be impossible for a wheelchair to get in. It's now four feet wide. The minimum is really 36 inches for a wheelchair accessibility. We also put in the curbless shower and we did do the plywood backing. So if you're still with me after all this time, I'm gonna share those bathrooms with you. My first effort was the cottage bathroom. But I didn't do what I should have done. I didn't put in a wall niche. There's no glass. There's no full mirror. There's no recessed kick plate. But I did put in a light tube and a toilet GFCI. My second effort was our master bath and I really did everything after a lot of research. I put in a recessed kick plate, full mirror with lights, no backsplash, a makeup mirror, a toilet GFCI, a full shower with glass and a niche and a pocket door. I actually did this bathroom along with the ensuite bathroom. In here we have a double sink, recessed kick plate, full mirror with lights, a makeup mirror. This one has a traditional bath with a shower niche and it has a two function fan switch. Our basement bathroom has a toilet GFCI, a dedicated shower with a shower niche and glass on two sides. It has a full mirror with lights and a floating vanity. I then started on our children's baths. This is my daughter's bathroom. For the kids, it has a double sink, full mirror with lights, a traditional bath with a shower niche, and a toilet GFCI. This was a particularly challenging bathroom in my other daughter's house. It's in the attic. And here you see a shower with a niche, separate sprayer, a glass wall, we put in a makeup mirror and it has a toilet GFCI. This was the last bathroom I did. It has a double sink, 
a makeup mirror, fan timer, no backsplash. It has a shower with offset handles, a glass wall, and an independent spray. So this is it. Thank you very much for doing this. I hope it's been helpful to you. I must say I enjoy these bathrooms when I use them. All the very best. Bye.